Good morning. All right, there's some intense love happening around here. It's a little awkward. Amen. My name is Andy. I'm one of the pastors here at Bayshore, and I just want to welcome you and thank you for being here with us. I don't know if this will resonate with any of you, um, but those of you that have had the opportunity to teach one of your children or all of your children, your teenagers, how to drive. I don't know if you've had the opportunity to do that. I'm on my second son right now of teaching him how to drive, and I have to be I have to be honest, there's not many times that I feel more hypocritical than when I'm sitting in the passenger seat of my car like I was yesterday with Caleb, telling him and teaching him the, role, the rules of the road. Yesterday, I, we taught him, or maybe a couple weeks ago, I taught him how to come to a complete stop at a red light before you make the right on red. I've taught him how to be patient and not tailgate drivers. I've taught him how to not pull out in front of people too quick because you're in a hurry. Or taught him everything that I know about good driving. The problem is I don't know that I practice what I'm teaching him. And there's moments where after I've taught him or, 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 or I've showed him or that he is now sitting in the passenger seat and I'm in the driver's seat and I've run a red light or I haven't come to a com complete stop. I, making a right on red, and so I feel hypocritical a little bit teaching him how to drive, and this morning, I say all of that to say that I'm with you this morning, and I'm physically going to place myself with you. I don't feel right standing elevated above you this morning because I'm not. I am right in the thick of this with you, and this morning as we talk about love, we talk about radical love, we talk about loving the world, receiving God's love radically enough allowing it to change our lives, allowing it to penetrate our lives, allowing it to penetrate our thought process to the point where we love the community the way that, that God would have us love them. I can't stand up here in front of you, elevated above you, teaching you how to do that without you knowing that I'm in the thick of it with you. I'd like to think and I'd like to say that I have everything down pat, that everything that I'm going to share with you today is... I have worked it out, I am perfect at it, I am good at it. But even this morning, I've become impatient with people. Even this morning, I've gotten frustrated with people. Even this morning, and, and maybe it's because I'm a little more sensitive to it because of studying and seeking the Lord this morning, I failed several different times in what I'm teaching you, and I need you to know that. And so I want to sit, I want to stand with you on the same level playing ground. Yes, I may be a pastor. Yes, I may be shepherding you. Yes, the Lord has called me to teach you. But at the same time, I'm sitting in the car with you. And there's times when I have the steering wheel and you're in the passenger seat. And there's times when you have the steering wheel and I'm in the passenger seat. And more than probably any message I've ever delivered up here, I don't know that I'm necessarily good at practicing what I'm about to preach to you this morning. And this morning, the message that the Lord has laid on my heart for us, for you to receive it, it's dependent upon a couple things. And I want to ask you this question. When you hear the word God, when you hear the word God, like as I speak that word, I speak that name over you this morning, what goes through your mind? What goes through your mind? How big is that thought? How big is the picture that you have in your mind? And then my question is, as you hear the word God, you start naturally thinking of church, the Bible, prayer, community. Because where we're at this morning, and in order for you to receive it, is dependent upon the, the size of and the immenseness of your thoughts when it comes to the being that we're discussing. And in several different platforms and several different avenues. I love when God speaks through themes to me. Like I like when, I love when God is speaking the same thing over and over and over in different prayer times, in different meetings. And it seemed like the past 10 days, everywhere I went, I was reminded of the enormity of God. I was reminded of, of the awness, if that's a word, that I can live in. I was reminded of the love of God and, and how thick and how tangible and how it can be experienced and it can be expressed. Everywhere I went, it seems like I was reminded of 
how we should live in awe of and how worthy he is and how incredible he is. And I thank the Lord for that voice into my life the past 10 days because I don't think I could stand here if the Lord didn't, wasn't constantly reminding me of how amazing he is and how amazing he wants to be to me and in my life. And so this morning's message is dependent upon where you're at with God, your thought process, the awness of God to you. And if you would, open your Bibles to two different passages, Revelations chapter 2. We're going to take a look at the church of Ephesus this morning. And then I want you to open your Bibles or you can put a marker or be ready to go to 1 John chapter 4. And we're talking about love this morning and we're continuing in this series called Radical. And if you have been here, you know that by radical I mean we're, we're experiencing God, we're loving God, we're humble enough. We have, the, we have a faith that's radical. And so because of that, we're living a life that literally changes culture literally changes the atmosphere of our situations, of our workplaces, of our communities, of our neighborhoods, of our schools. That when we walk in, something different, there's something different. We light up the room, no matter how dark that room might be. And this morning, probably the most important message in this whole line of, of series or these whole lessons on radical that I've been talking about and how important it is to be motivated by God's love and how God wants us to operate out of it, not for it. And this morning, before, if you catch nothing by what I say this morning, I, want, I believe the Lord wants you to know you do not have to do anything. You do not have to work for it. You do not have to attend church for it. You do not have to go to seven different prayer meetings in a week. You don't have to do anything, anything to receive God's love other than just to open your heart to it. Because the Lord has already done it for you. God sent his son. He, God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him, whoever would make him Lord of his life, would not perish but have everlasting life. So it's there. The doorway is there. And all we need to do is walk through it. All we need to do is walk through it. I don't know if you enjoy movie previews. You know, when you go to the movies, it seems like there's about 30 minutes of movie previews now. In fact, I have to be very careful because I can down all my popcorn and my soda before we ever get to the movies because there's so many previews. And this past time, we were at the movies, and we were watching, and I'm like, wasn't in too big of a hurry to get there because I know you have about 20-ish minutes of movie previews before you actually get to the main feature. And so sitting there and I'm watching glimpses and they're previewing different movies and I'm thinking, I didn't pay to come see that movie. I'm not going to pay to go see that movie. You don't need to show me that movie. Anyway, so the last time around I realized, wait a minute. It's all advertising and it's all marketing because while you're sitting here, they want, you, they want to give you a glimpse of what's coming in the future. They want to give you just enough of a glimpse and they want to keep you, they want to create in you this cliffhanger type feeling to where you have to go see that movie. They don't give you the ending, they, they don't really even give you the plot. They give you just enough to pull you in. They give you just enough to pull you in. And in a sense, that's kind of what the book of Revelations is. The book of Revelation is a book where Jesus showed up to the Apostle John who was exiled for his belief and he's sitting on the island of Patmos and, he's in, and the, the Bible says he's literally worshiping God in spirit. And the Lord shows up, Jesus shows up and begins to download into him prophecy. And this morning again as you enter into the book of Revelation, you know it's funny, I'm taking an online class on the book of Revelation and I hadn't realized this before but I think if you're like me, the book of Revelation can be a very, very confusing book. But ironically, it's not meant to be. Ironically, it's meant to clarify. It's meant to, to make things a little more clear. But then you think to yourself, well, everything in it is, is spoken through prophecy and symbolism. And, and, and there's all kinds of weird animals and crazy things going on. And the visions that John saw that he recorded don't clarify anything. But literally, revelation means the unveiling of. And so Revelations was meant for two different things. One, it was meant to unveil Jesus Christ, that he had been crucified, and that he was coming back again. And this is kind of a glimpse. This is, this is your, you, even though we're living in the feature presentation, this is what's going to come. This is your preview. 
a prophetic preview. And I don't know where you stand or where you're at. I will tell you that in order to understand the book of Revelation, you need to have a firm belief in prophecy. You need to have a firm belief in the fact that the prophetic words of God are still being spoken over the church and over people today. In fact, it helps if you flow in this just a little bit. There's been times and moments in my life where God has downloaded a word for me for the church or for individuals, and he's done it symbolically. He hasn't necessarily done it through, hey, this is exactly what you need to do. He's given me visions of symbolic things. Just this week, gave me a vision of the state of Florida for somebody. And he gave me a vision of a map and that the Lord would begin to move through a certain area that was coming up and that the Lord was going to begin to bless the state of Florida in a way that it's never been blessed before with, the move, with an, evangel an evangel evangel evangelistic move. I get tongue-tied sometimes when I get excited. And so if you've ever had that happen, if you've ever had a word of prophecy spoken over you that's come true, like somebody's literally said to you, hey, so-and-so, this is what's going to happen. And it's happened. It helps when that happens to you because you can believe the book of Revelations a little bit more. I stand in this very room today. I stand in this very room today because of prophecy. Two years ago, a pastor friend of mine spoke over my wife and I and spoke that he would be moving us from one place to another. Didn't tell us where, didn't show us what was going on. He just said, be ready to move. And here we are. And here we are. So it helps. It helps to understand and believe that God still speaks to his church through prophets, through prophecy, through visions, and through revelations. Because if you do, then it helps you to understand where we're coming just a little bit. So in Revelations chapter 2, we see the beginning of the warnings that Jesus was giving to the seven churches of Asia. Now, here's the interesting thing about these warnings is they weren't just necessarily warnings and commendations for the church of that day as you begin to study and you look at the seven different churches you realize that the church of today of today is dealing with some of the very issues that the church of that day was dealing with and some of the things that Jesus said to John to record down hadn't even happened a couple of the churches weren't even in existence yet the issues and the problems they were having weren't even there yet. So let's take a real quick look at the timeline of Ephesians or the church of Ephesus. The church of Ephesus began in 52 AD. Paul swung by there on his third missionary journey and whenever Paul showed up somewhere, he went looking to share the gospel of Jesus Christ and he quickly shares it, gets back on a boat and leaves and out of that births the Ephesian church. In AD 54 through maybe 56, Paul shows back up and he teaches and he begins to show the Ephesians, and he commends the Ephesians for their love. The one thing he specifically, in AD 62, when he re writes the letter to the church of Ephesus, he commends them in chapter 1 for their love for God and their love for people. He commends them for their love for God and their love for people. And then in AD 66, John, the apostle John, moves him and his mother to Ephesians because it was becoming the epicenter of the church at that time. And then about AD 81 through 96, Revelations chapter 2 comes to John and the warning to the Ephesians church. And thus began the decline of the Ephesian church. The very thing that Paul commended the Ephesian church at the beginning for, John is now warning the Ephesians church that they've lost. And so that's where we find ourselves in Revelations chapter 2, and it says this. Jesus himself said to the angel of the church in Ephesus, write this. These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds. I know your hard work and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not. And you have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardship for my name and, not, and have not grown weary. Pretty good report. If I'm a pastor in the church of Ephesians, I'm not listening to anything else. I'm like, dude, we're doing good. I'm kicked back. Might take the afternoon off. I'm like, huh, Jesus commended us. We're doing great. We've got the system down. We, we've got the setup system. We've got everything flowing good. We're ready 
We got ourselves all set up for church this morning. We've got our home churches flowing good. We're loving the community. We're going to make home kits for MCC. Man, we're doing great. But Jesus doesn't stop there. Jesus goes on to say, yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. And, and I, as I read that line, I'm like, wait, how? Jesus asks them, wait, he just commends them for what they're doing, for their perseverance, for their hard work. Paul had commended this church for their love for God and their love for people. And he hears Jesus saying, consider how far you have fallen. And then he says, repent. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. But I have this in your favor. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which the Nicolaitans was a group that was hungry for power. Out of the Nicolaitans, we have some of the systematic ways that we do church nowadays. We see some of the Catholic church, and we see some of the, the some of the, the, What's the word I'm looking for? Some of the governance or the liturgy of church. He says, I hate their practices. And I'm glad you do. And then he goes on to say, whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the church. To the, and here's where I think sometimes we get focused on the negative and we get focused on the warning and we think, oh God, God's going to bring his hand of judgment down. But listen to this invitation. To the one who is victorious. This is where God's love shows up. To the one who is victorious, I will give them the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. God's not warning them because he wants to bring the hammer down on them. God's not warning them because he wants to wipe them off the face of the earth. God is warning them because he wants them to be victorious. God is warning them because he later says, every father who loves their child disciplines their child. In fact, all seven churches got somewhat similar of the same word. Like all seven churches, the Lord at the end of the warning says, listen, if you're willing to listen to me, if you're willing to repent of the things that I'm saying, of the warnings that I have for you, you will be victorious. You will live in victory. And I think sometimes we have a tendency of focusing on the hammer. In fact, as I began this message, I started thinking, oh, I'm going to bring the hammer down. I'm going to bring the hammer down. And the Lord says, no, you're not. You're going to tell the church how much I love them. And because I love them so much, because I love them so much, I don't need them doing things out of duty. I don't need the systems built around man-made, man-made systems and man-made mindsets. I need them built around relationship with me. I need your systems to show how much I love them. I need your systems to be a conduit of love for the community. And if you're not willing to do it that way, I literally felt the Lord here say this to me in a prayer time. If you're not willing to do it out of love, then don't do it. Then don't do it. And my first point in the message today is the why matters. The why matters. The why matters. To the Lord, it matters why you're here. If you're here out of obligation or duty, I'm glad that you're here and I'm glad that motivated you this morning. But I don't want it to be what motivates you every single week. I don't want it to be the reason that you're here. The Lord doesn't want that to be the reason that you're here. He wants you to be here because you love him and you love each other. And you couldn't wait to get here this morning to experience him, to experience the depth of that love with your brothers and sisters in Christ. But see, we've gotten it backwards a little bit. See, like the Ephesians church, we've gotten caught up in our systems. And as a pastor, I have to, I have to repent of that. I can spend more time thinking through our systems as a church. That, okay, we need, I talked about this last week, we need, we need this, we need that, we need organization, we need this. We need all of these things to work together systematically. And when they do, the church will grow. And in our culture, it works. In fact, in the Ephesian culture, it was, church, it, was, it was working because the Ephesian church was growing faster than any other church in that area. That's why it had become kind of the epicenter of Asia for Christianity. But Jesus was saying, you've forsaken the love for me. You're bashing people with my word. You're overbearing people with works. 
And because of that, people aren't experiencing my love like they should be. Church, this morning, I hope if anything else, you'll understand the why is because God loves you. The why is because God loves you. And when we understand the why, and we operate out of the why, the why is what motivates us. And, and the why, the love of God, is a much greater motivator. The why, the love of God, is a much greater, greater component to express to the world. They're going to receive it so much more. I read some statistics a couple of weeks back about the generational decline of the things of the church. And as I studied for this message, I realized why. I realized why the younger generations are beginning to walk away from it because the why is skewed. Our why is different than what God desires it to be. It's one of the things that, if you remember, one of the first words, one of the first words that the Lord placed on my heart was the word genuine. And we're going to see that point in just a moment. The word genuine. That's why I feel like we are to be a body of believers that genuinely loves God Genuinely loves others. And we'll take a litmus test in just a few moments to see exactly where we're at on that. Love is so important that in 1 Corinthians 13, after the spiritual gifts chapter, after Paul goes through with the Corinthians, all the spiritual gifts we have at our disposal, he then begins to say, listen, you can speak in tongues, you can prophesy, you can heal, but if you don't do that in love... It's worthless. In fact, he calls you a clanging gong or a loud cymbal. The world's not going to hear you near as much, or if at all, if it's not in love. If it's not in love. 1 John 4, 7 through 21 says this. Again, it's John saying, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his son and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, since God so sacrificed for us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is made complete in us. This is how we know that we live in him and he in us. He has given us his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in them, and they in God. And, see we, and so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. He says it again. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. This is how love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence in the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. In this world, we are like Jesus. In this world, we are like Jesus. There is no fear in love. But perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. And we like to preach punishment. We like to bring that hammer down. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. Whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or a sister is a liar. For whoever, do, for whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. And he has given us this command. Anyone who loves God will also, notice that, will also. One version says must, but I don't like that version. I like the version that says we will. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will be his witnesses. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you don't have a decision to make. You, the Holy Spirit has control of your life, and the love of God is compelling you and motivating you to love. Anyone who loves God will also love their brother and sister. So how do we walk radically in love? What, do, what components do we need to have? And the first one is radical love walks in humility. Radical love walks in humility because radical love knows that the story is not necessarily about them. Radical love understands that the story is about the author, and the author is God. And so this morning, I've enlisted some help. I'm going to invite Carson Yoder, who's with us for the last Sunday before he heads back to YWAM. And Carson's going to take over here for just a few moments. 
And he's going to share what the Lord has laid on his heart when it comes to radical love. Hello. Good morning, church. Um, If we could just pray real quick, that would be great. Uh, Father God, I love you, and I thank you for this incredible opportunity, Lord. I just pray that right now I'm simply the conduit, Lord, of what you want to say, the megaphone of what you want to say to your church this morning. It's not any of my words, but it's just completely yours, in Jesus' name. So we have this night in YWAM called um, Barefoot Night, and it's it's one of the first nights, it's probably the third night in uh, in your school, when you do your initial school in YWAM, and we listen to a sermon that's all about surrendering to the Lord. And it's all about giving everything to the Lord because he's that good and he can trust him as the good shepherd. And I remember, um, and then they have this time where you can pray and um, really, if you feel led to, come up and get this um, little survival cord um, and make it as a daily reminder of your surrendering to the Lord. And I remember how hard it was to surrender everything. And I don't, I still have no idea everything I've surrendered. I don't know what all I'm going to be surrendering in my future. I know what I've surrendered in my past. I've surrendered my, my, at least these next two years of my future. But I don't know everything. And living in humility, life of, and living in a life of humility is walking in daily surrender to the Lord. It's not something that is just a one-time done, like this one-time court, oh, I surrendered everything to Jesus. No, it's a daily, Lord, I am going to walk in what you tell me to do today. If you want me to talk to this person, I will. And I have to admit and repent that there are times where I do not do that, and I'm not, I don't do that well. But it's all about surrendering everything to the Lord because, number one, he's that trustworthy. When you trust the Lord as your good shepherd, and it talks about in Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. And he's saying all these things. When he goes to the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because the Lord is with me. And in John 10, it talks about how Jesus is the good shepherd. He's talking um, how the sheep know his voice and they know him and follow him because they trust him. That is what it looks like. One of the reasons, um, one of the things that it looks like to walk in humility is you walk in. Love and humility are, are extremely close. Because you cannot be prideful and love people. It just, it just, it's like oil and water. It doesn't go together. You can't come up to somebody and say, oh, I truly love you. But when you're walking in pride, it just doesn't, it just doesn't work. I tried that. I did that for about two weeks on my outreach. And it hurt a very close dear friend of mine so badly. And I can choose when he came to me and he said, Hey, man, you've really just been walking in pride recently, and this is all the things that you've been doing. And I can choose to either say, oh, no, I'm, I'm good. That's not me. That's not anything I've done. Or I can choose to humbly say, okay, I receive that, and I'm sorry so much for hurting you. Because when you walk in pride, it hurts people. It not only hurts yourself, but it hurts other people because they see that around you. And there's a difference between true humility and false humility. For, as an example, it's just something, it's just a, an over-exaggeration just to make a point. Um, but say I went up to Andy and I said, hey, how are you doing? And Andy goes, oh, I'm so tired. Why are you so tired? Oh, I got to get up early to feed the homeless. That's false humility. He's seeking affirmation in saying that because he wants to feel loved in saying that. I'm not saying that's what he does. I'm just using that as an example. Um, but we need to find that affirmation from the love of God. We need to be fathered like we do when you, you were young. Because when we were, I was growing up as kids, and I remember when I was growing up, my dad was a pastor. Um, and you look up to your father with everything. And for those who don't have a father, it would be your mother or um, whoever is that role in your life. But you look up to them with everything. You look on them to support you. You respect them. You obey them because you love them. And because he's that good, and he's proven himself to be trustworthy, and that's the same with the Lord, and you respect him because of who he is, and you depend on him for everything. That is true humility, is coming to the Lord and saying, Lord, I daily surrender, I daily give up my life so that I can be in a relationship with you, so that I can be loved by you, so that I can love other people well. Because you can't, 
you can't love if you don't have any love for yourself and you don't receive love from the Father. It all stems out of your intimate times with the Lord, but it's like saying if you try to go give somebody love or somebody asks you, hey, can I have 20 bucks and I have no cash in my wallet, and I say, yeah, here, it just doesn't work. You need to let the Father love you and receive that Father's love to be able to give love to other people. And trust is a big aspect of that. Respect also, and it talks about in Romans 13, respecting your authority and being in submission to them um, because of their place and authority over you. And the Lord should be the number one in everything in your life. And then walking in love is obedience. Saying, Lord, even if I don't necessarily feel like doing this, even if I don't necessarily even want to do this, that was my, that was my thing with YWAM. My third week of DTS, the Lord spoke to me very clearly to go on a research trip and to spend two years, at least two years on staff. And I did not want to do it because I was so scared. Two years. Oh, that's so long. In reality, it's not. When you're serving the Lord, it was a, I, I now count that as a privilege to be able to serve the Lord and give up my life for two years. But that was initially what was so hard is just giving that over to the Lord and obeying the Lord. But true love is obedient. True love respects your authority. True love trusts Jesus as the good shepherd. True love knows when to rebuke you in love. And true love also knows when to pick you up and encourage you in love. So when you trust Jesus as the good shepherd, you not only are you walking in humility, but you're saying, Lord, I love you so much, and I know, number one, that you know what's best for me, that your knowledge is so much infinitely more than mine, and your wisdom is so much more than mine. It's like, if you compare a sheep and a goat, I don't know much about farm animals, but um, in my mind, goats are ornery, and they're, they can be turds at times, they can do whatever the heck they want, and you can be nice one moment, and the next moment, they'll headbutt you. And with sheep, from what I understand, it's not that way. Sheep, when you have a good shepherd, the sheep know that, number one, he knows better than I do. Number two, I can trust him because he's proven himself. And number three, he loves us because he will sacrifice his life for us. That's exactly what Jesus talks about in John 10 when he's saying, I am the good shepherd. I will sacrifice my life for the sheep. The sheep know my voice. They won't follow. If someone, an imposter comes, they know immediately that that is not Jesus. That is not the Lord. Because they know his voice so clearly. That's what it looks like to walk in humility. Walking in love. And, and a lot of that comes through true repentance. True repentance is hard. That was one of the things that I struggled with while I was on outreach for the last month. Was I came to this place where I repented and I, I felt like I needed to. Instead of being actually convicted. And actually wanting to change. I came to this point where I was like, if somebody would get frustrated, I'd be like... I, I just want to say I, I got frustrated with you. I don't know why, but I'm sorry. But it wasn't out of a place of humility. It was out of this place of I don't want to hold this, hold this to against them. And I know that, it, that it's bad, so I want to repent, but I never felt necessarily convicted, and there, there was no change. True repentance, it can come through different things, um, Actually, excuse me, true repentance comes through one thing. It comes through being broken by God. It comes through saying, Lord, whatever you want from me, search my heart and know me. David was so concerned. If you look at Psalm 51, he was so concerned with walking in repentance to the Lord. Search my heart and know me, creating me a clean heart, O oh God. Because his relationship with the Lord was so strong, and he wanted the Lord to be in his place in such a radical way that he didn't want anything in between him and the Lord. And with he, when he was in Bathsheba, it took, um, when he was off on his own thing, doing things with Bathsheba, it took Nathan the prophet to come and say, hey, this is where, I, this is what the Lord is telling me. Like, and through this story, and David had a choice. Back in those times, if you didn't like, if you were the king, you didn't like what the prophet said, you could just, here come, and then here comes the next one. You could choose to just say, no, I don't like that, and I'm, I'm going to come to the next one. But instead, he chose, because Nathan spoke out of love and he spoke it with authority, he said, okay, I'm sorry, Lord. And he cried out to the Lord. And saying, Lord, create in me a clean, heart, clean, excuse me, a clean heart, oh God. 
And that is what is one of the biggest things to walk in humility and walk in love, is being able to truly repent and walk in surrender to the Lord. Thank you. Real quick before Carson goes, um, Carson's going to be headed back to YWAM Reading in just about 10 days or so. Um, as you were speaking, I felt like the Lord wanted you to pray over us. Uh, Carson's kind of done a unofficial um, internship with us. He spent Wednesdays in the office with us, uh, hung out with us, prayed with us. Um, and it's just been incredible. And as you taught, I'm just, I'm just blown away by the softness of your heart. And I believe the Lord wants you to know right now that what you just did in this room, you'll be doing in the nations. The Lord wants you to know that this is just, a, this is just one little spot. There, will, there are many different countries that you will get the opportunity to do what you just did and teach on humility. Mm-hmm. And so this morning, would you, we were going to pray over you and commission you out, but I felt like the Lord wants you to commission us in what we're talking about this morning because he's already worked it out in your heart. So would you pray over us? I know that seems a little backwards than normal, but that's, that's the Lord. And, and the spirit that's at work in you, the Lord wants you to commission that spirit to work, at, work in us as we are here. So would you do that for me? Yep. Father God, I thank you for this opportunity, this incredible opportunity to be able to um, shepherd this congregation and, and just being able to share a little bit about what you put on my heart, Lord. Lord, I just pray for commissioning right now for a genuine spirit of commissioning to come over this church. Lord, I know that you've called this church to certain things, to be genuine and to love people well. And Lord, it says in, in the Gospels that there are two greatest commandments. One is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And so, Lord, that, that doesn't come through pride. That comes through humility and saying, Lord, I love you so much that I want to tell other people. And so, Lord, I pray right now that we can just be sweetly broken, Lord, and wholly surrendered to your heart. Be humbled by your majesty and the the awesome creator that you are. And just say, Lord, I surrender everything to you. And we just come to you with a both hands open mentality to just say, Lord, here is my everything. Here is my finances. Here is my family. Here is my time. Here is my job. And just say, Lord, I surrender that all to you because you're so good and I love you, Lord. And I want to be surrendered to you. I want to be equally yoked with you, Lord. So I just pray that right now we just even just take some time and really just ask the Lord what, if there's certain things that he wants us to give up. Um, yeah, Lord, I just, we just give you the space to move right now. Lord, search our hearts and know us right now, Jesus. And Father, I just commission Carson. Father, the move that you're doing in his heart, Lord, may we recognize that and sense it in our hearts. And may that same move take place in us. Father, I pray for protection over him. I pray for wisdom. I pray for direction. Father, as he goes, we commission him to go in your name. Thank you for raising him up and doing the work that you've done through the BTS and through his summer here with us, Father. May he go... May he go in boldness. May he go in boldness in the power and the presence of your Holy Spirit in his name. Amen. Amen. Awesome, man. I'm proud of you. Love you, bro. Amen. Carson used a phrase that just hit me. I don't know if it hit you, but I'm going to help it hit you if it didn't hit you. Some of us just need to allow ourselves to be fathered. Some of us just need to allow ourselves to be fathered by the Father. Our next point is radical love extends grace. I'm sorry, radical love expresses itself genuinely. Radical love expresses itself genuinely. Where in the, where, how, as we grow up, how do we become so serious in life? You know, I've been watching, yesterday I had the opportunity to, sitting and I'm watching the, the Little League World Series and I'm watching 
carousel play Japan. And I'm loving the joy and the genuineness on the boys as, as, they're, as they're playing. And, and during the game, I'm flipping over during the commercials to see the Cubs play the Nationals. And the Cubs were kind of getting beat up by the Nationals, so I wasn't really happy about that. So I stayed with the Little League guys. And I'm watching the joy and the expression on these boys' faces because they're just playing a game they love. And the game's over, and Carousel beats Japan, and they're hooping and hollering, and they're jumping all over the place, and they're, they're just expressing their joy, and Japan is in tears. Japan is in tears because they genuinely lost the championship, yet they had the respect to stay there and hug on the other team and to congratulate them. And I thought to myself, you don't see that in the major league. We won't see that in the World Series in a couple of months. Yeah, we may see some tears shed by a few men, but we'll see frustration, we'll see anger, we'll see, a, we'll see a different type of emotion in the adult men when they lose the world championship versus what I saw yesterday. I saw passion, I saw disappointment, I saw praise, I saw excitement, I saw gloves thrown in the air, I saw jumping and leaping and praising each other, maybe even a couple of the cr Christian kids praising God. But somewhere along the lines, we lose our expression. Or maybe we haven't even been taught expression. And I don't know about you, but when it comes to things that I enjoy and things that I love, I express myself. And I know I'm an emotional person. Yesterday, as I'm watching that game, as we get towards the end, you know, we're in the bottom of the six. It's five to two. Somehow Japan gets bases loaded. Um, and somehow the catcher lets the ball get by and two runs score. So it's five to four. And all of a sudden, the tying run is on third base with the go-ahead run or the walk-off run is at the plate. And I'm like, I'm freaking out. Like, and if you ever watch sports with me, I get anxiety. I get anxious. I'm even getting anxious and, and filled with anxiety right now. And I, get, I go from sitting like this in my chair to sitting like this. And I hurt my knee. I almost threw my knee out the other day watching sports. Watching sports. That's why I don't play sports anymore. But I'm watching, and this, this batter hits a drive. And I, my, my stomach goes, ooh, this one's going to drop in. And out of nowhere... This little guy grabs it and makes a spectacular catch in center field to end the game. To end the game. And the place goes nuts. The crowd goes nuts. And I think to myself, that's incredible. That's incredible that we can express ourselves on a diamond. We can express ourselves on a 100-yard field the last moments of the Florida-Miami game. I don't know where you stand with who won or lost last night. I'm just thankful college football has started. And so I don't care who's playing, I'm watching, even though I really don't have a, a dog in the fight last night, which by the way, it is college football season, so expect the Notre Dame references to start, okay? Anyway, and at the end of the game, I'm noticing my emotions are running high because for some dumb reason, I was pulling for the Gators. I don't know why. Maybe it's because I don't like hurricanes. I'm not sure. You know, there was a named storm that happened yesterday. I don't want a hurricane anywhere near us. So anyway, that's just how my mind works. And then... The Gators pull it out, and their defense comes through, and they stop the Hurricanes, and they win the game. No title on the line. But we get emotional over silly things. I get emotional, and I express myself over silly things. What does it mean to love genuinely? I think it means to love expecting nothing in return. I think it means to give, expecting nothing in return. I think it means to be motivated to help, expecting nothing in return. Giving the shirt off of our back, expecting nothing in return. You know, we've talked about the MCC school kits, and I, I encourage you, grab one, two, three, 25, 30, 100 of those bags in the back and take them. But don't expect anything in return. I read this week some 78,000 school kits have been given, and those school kits go to children who have been displaced all over the world from their homes, whether they're refugees or whether it's been natural disasters or, or weather moments. They go to children in places where have, they have been displaced from their homes. It's a way for us to touch tangibly. But don't expect anything returned. Don't bring, their, don't bring your, your backpacks back here, 10 of them on your back saying, look what I've done. And don't do it thinking that God is going to love you any more because you've done it. Or any less because you didn't do it. 
as I've said earlier, I think that the Lord wants us to get back to a relational system of being willing to share what we have without anything in return. It's an, it's a, it floors me over the years as a pastor how many times I've heard or had people express to me because they've given monetarily to the church that they should have some say in what's going on. Somewhere in our society, we have tied our money to a feeling of control. And I believe that radical, le- radical love gives expecting nothing in return. It gives expecting yourself not to necessarily need or want to have to have a say in what is being done or said. The class I'm taking on, relation, or on, on Revelation, the instructor, talks about how lazy the English language can be. Like we have the word love. And I will use the word love for my wife. I will tell Danielle over and over and over. I will tell the boys over and over and over. I love you. But then I'll use that same word. I'll use the same word love for Chick-fil-A, for Notre Dame. We'll use the same exact word in the English language for the same exact feeling, but not necessarily the same emotion. Whereas in the Bible, in the Greek, you see, you see at least seven different Greek forms of love, and they're different words. They wouldn't have thrown the word agape out flippantly, and that is the word here. That is the word that is used here. Radical love expresses itself genuinely in worship, in community, in prayer, in service, and it expects nothing in return. Radical love extends grace, and this is a big one. This is a big one. We're going to land on it. Radical love extends grace to itself and to others. Carson referenced King David in Psalm 51, and we, him and I talked a little bit about this this week. I want to talk a, real quickly about the word shame. Did you know that there's a biblical form of shame that the Lord wants us to experience? The problem is he doesn't want us to live in it. He wants shame to be, in a sense, a stop sign. He wants shame in itself to be a signal that we need to repent and so there's, there's a good feeling of shame that needs to come over us. We don't need to have shame that our sins are forgiven, or we don't have to have shame of what was because the Lord has forgiven us of that. But in moments when I know that I act or I think or I say something that's counterintuitive to the design that God has in my life, there should be a feeling. And I don't necessarily say that it should be guilt but there should be this signifier to me that, oh, wait a minute, I'm on a slippery slope here. And I believe that our conscience, through the power of the Holy Spirit, allows us to feel that. But we don't have to live in it. We don't have to stay in it. It's a signifier. In a sense, right here, to the church of Ephesus, Jesus was bringing a little bit of shame to them and saying, listen, listen to me. I like what you're doing over here, but you're not doing it for the right reason. So repent. Repent. And if you repent, you're going to live victorious because I don't want you to live in the shame that I just brought you. I want it to be a signifier that you can live in victory, that you can live in power. Too many of us in this room have a tendency of living in the shame when it wasn't necessarily supposed to be a house that we built around us. It was supposed to be a sign that we saw that pointed us to Jesus. That pointed us to Jesus. And so radical love begins with extending yourself grace. Quit being so hard on yourself, church. Quit letting the enemy remind you of your past or where you've come from. Start letting God show you where you're headed. Instead of living in regret, instead of living in what has been, start living in victory of what is going to be. The truth of it. The power of it. The joy of it. And it starts with extending grace to yourself. Because if you can't extend it to yourself, you're going to have a hard time extending it to others. David was faced with the prophet Nathan, who shared a story with him. And all of a sudden, he realized the man that Nathan was talking about was himself. 
And David in that moment felt shame. And he realized that if he wasn't careful, the presence of God was going to be diminished in his life. And he was going to be, and he was on a slippery slope. And what does he do? He repents. He asks the Lord not to cast him away out of his presence. He asks the Lord to restore unto him the joy of his salvation. He asks the Lord to create in him a clean heart, wiping away the thread that was put in him that led him to the destructive path that he was on. And because of that, he was labeled a man after God's own heart because he was repentive because of the shame. He didn't build a house. He didn't build a palace. He didn't try to hide from it. He just simply let it point him to Jesus and to God. So this morning, as the worship team comes on back up, I want to ask you a couple of questions. I feel like the church over the decades, especially in our country, some for good reason and some for not so good reason, we've fallen into systematic ways of doing church. And just like the church of Ephesus, I think the Lord is calling Bay Shore Church back to a love for him and a love for others. It's the only way that it's the only way that our lampstand is going to burn bright in this community. I've lived in Sarasota, many of you know this since 1984, I was 10 years old when we moved here. I've had a couple of opportunities throughout the years to move away and once even tried to and the Lord said no. I hurt for Sarasota church. I hurt for our community. I drive the roads and the streets of Sarasota and I hurt inside. I hurt for our school system. I hurt for the lost students that travel up and down the hallways in the classrooms of our public school system, especially the high schools. Carry a heavy burden And just recently, the Lord has asked me to repent of being judgmental towards some of it and start loving them again by putting down my own reputation, by putting down my own wants and desires and seeking him, seeking him for our community. And we spent a little bit of time Tuesday night or Monday night at our prayer time doing this. But I'm going to ask you a couple of questions, and I want you to think about how you interact with your coworkers. I want you to think of how you interact when you're downtown or with your neighbors. Are you patient and kind? Are you jealous or proud of those that you're around? Are you demanding? When you don't get your way, how do you react? If Bayshore goes in a different direction than what you're feeling, how do you react? Do you hold a grudge? Are you irritable? Here's one for me and for the church leaders in our room. Do we rejoice when we see other churches struggle? When we see other people struggle? When we see other church leaders fall? And unfortunately, those characteristics describe the church a whole lot more than love, than patience, than kindness, than endurance. The Bible says that we should be hopeful, we should be rejoiceful, we should be filled with endurance, we should be filled with grace and filled with love. And I, it scares me, church, that we've been filled with too much of the negative lately as of late. And this is a weird time that we live in. I'll be the first to admit. Navigating love or navigating truth in love is something that 
a tricky thing to navigate. And I have failed miserably at a point in my life, and you may hear that story in the next few weeks to come. A good friend of mine, a roommate of mine, years and years ago came out of the closet as a homosexual. And I beat him up with the Bible instead of loving him and praying for him and interceding for him. I guess you're going to hear the story now. He passed away of a heart attack six years later. Broke communication with me and I never had the opportunity to love him. He was in Danielle and I's wedding. He sang at our wedding. He was one of my groomsmen. And I came at him with the full force of God's word. And I pounded him with it. And I judged him. One of the worst mistakes of my life. I'm not saying that I shouldn't have stood for truth. I should have. But I will never, ever, ever come at somebody like that again. I was hurt. I felt lied to. I was selfish. And I didn't leave room for me to be able to minister to him. So it's a tricky path that we're on. I, I'm, I'm, go I'm not, I'm going to admit that. Navigating truth and love like never before is not an easy thing to do, but I think in the power of the Holy Spirit, with his discernment and his direction, we can do that. I think too many times from pulpits over the decades, pastors have enjoyed preaching hell versus heaven. Preaching the hammer or the, the righteousness of God versus the love and the grace of God. And again, it's a fine line. I believe in grace, but I also believe that God has designed life in a way that we should live. He loved us enough to do that in order to experience it. He's inviting us to live it his way, to live victoriously. So if you would, close your eyes for a moment. Let's take this test again. Have you lost your patience with somebody lately? Or do you regularly lose your patience? Is there jealousy or pride or anger? Have you been demanding of spirit lately? irritable and I'm not talking like a one time I'm talking like has this flow been what's been coming at you regularly or out of you regularly or do you smile just a bit and your heart skips a beat just a bit when somebody around you falls messes up Have you just simply lost your first love for God? When I first met Danielle, there was not much I wouldn't do for her. I traveled all the way to Kentucky and back one Christmas just to be able to spend a few days with her. And now if her car breaks down at Target, I have her call AAA. We have a tendency of being that way with the Lord not allowing our lives to be interrupted. I'm going to ask you to make a radical move this morning. The Lord's been speaking to you, and I want to take a moment and let the Holy Spirit just speak to you. What is the Holy Spirit saying to you in this moment? It's going to take some humility. You have to set your side, yourself aside something I've said has hit you, maybe convicted you, maybe there's just a little bit of shame in you, I want you to stand right now. I want you to stand.
Our churches need to be the most loving, restful places, most open, ready to receive. That's what the Lord wants Bay Shore to be. There is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. If we are faithful to confess, the Lord is, faith, is faithful to can forgive us of all unrighteousness. We get to walk in that. If you're right there near somebody, even if you don't know them, that's good. Would you put your hands on them this morning? One of my favorite prayers I'm about to pray comes out of Ephesians. Paul prayed it over the Ephesians, and we're going to just simply end. Paul had just finished talking about the mysterious plan of God's grace. he says, when I think of all this, I fall to my knees and pray to the Father, the creator of everything in heaven and on earth. And this morning, I pray over us as a church and those specifically that are standing that from, that we would understand that from his glorious unlimited resources, that he would empower us. He would empower you with inner strength through his spirit. And as he does that, Christ is going to make his home in your heart as you trust in him. As you allow your roots to grow down into his love, he will keep you strong. And I pray right now that we would understand the power, as all God's people should. We would understand how wide, how long, how high, and how deep God's love really is. And as we come to a better understanding of that, I pray that we would experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to fully understand. Only then will we be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. Now, all glory, those of you that are standing, if you would raise your arms with me as we surrender to the Lord for the next moment. So now, now all glory to God, who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. Glory to him in the church in Christ Jesus through all generations, forever and ever and ever Amen. And Father God, I pray right now, Lord, over this church. I pray that we would be empowered by you. That by the Holy Spirit inside of us, Father, we would be empowered. We would come to a better understanding this morning of your love for us. And that we would again begin to operate out of that love and stop trying to operate for it, Father. Father, I repent of that in my own life. And I thank you, Jesus. I thank you, Father, for knowing that we can walk victoriously. We can walk in freedom. We can walk blessed this morning. Thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you would, everybody, if you would stand for me, we're going to end the same way that I started us. The same way that I started us. I'm going to take a quick moment. I want you to take a quick moment here in just a second, and I want you to hug on somebody. I want you to greet. I don't. We talked a little bit about this a few weeks back, but let's make our greetings meaningful. Let's make our love for each other meaningful. Let's look each other in the eyes and say, God loves you. Have a blessed day. Let's mean it. No more casual acquaintances in this room. Let's just love on each other.